croeso i chi gyd i sesiwn agoriadol gwyl ymchwil cynta prifysgol a brystwyth ar newid hinsaw. Fe enw i yw'r athro Anwen Jones a fi yw'r dirprwy isgyngellor cyfadran y celfyddydau ar gwyddorau cymdeithasol a fi fydd yn cadeirio'r panel agoriadol yma y bore yma. Welcome to you all to the opening panel session of Aberystwyth University's first festival of research on climate change. I'm Professor Anwen Jones, Pro Vice Chancellor for the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, and I will be chairing this panel. I'm also delighted to welcome Virginios Zinkevichos, the EU Commissioner for the Environment, Oceans and Fisheries, to deliver the keynote speech for this panel. Um, I think perhaps it might be just as well for me to say a couple of very brief words about the significance of this uh, festival of research to the university. It is, uh, it is an opening um, a festival that we hope to develop. Uh, we are very glad that we are able to hold it this year around the very significant theme of climate change, um, but we hope to uh, make it part of our 150th celebrations um, and also make it a regular event at the university. Um, I think Colin would, would probably have, have been a lot more erudite than myself, but I think we both probably share a, a mutual understanding of the importance of the event to us as an internal community of researchers, but also in terms of our interface with, with uh, external bodies and a public agenda in, in the really important field of climate change, in which we are obviously invested as a university. Uh, I could tell you a couple of interesting things around what we're doing currently. Uh, I know that we have a programme uh, to um, address our carbon emissions, to um, modernise our lighting, uh, and I think also are looking into the possibility of a, a solar panel. Uh, sited somewhere on the University estate, and we are very lucky here at Upper Street to have a, a very green estate that offers us some um, opportunities in terms of making a contribution to those values that are central to climate change and sustainability as a whole. We're also currently engaged in a student project, which is funded by the British Academy, where we are one of six universities who are, are launching challenges to our student body and they then spend a considerable part of the year guided by uh, Students for Sustainability UK trying to address those challenges. Those are just a, a couple of, of things that we're doing at both ends of the spectrum in this field, but clearly this festival today and the input both from our external experts and our community of internal researchers is a particularly important threshold for us. So I'm going to move on now um, and introduce uh, Virginios and Kevichos, who I am thrilled to have with us today. And I'm not going to say that I'm glad Colin is ill because that would not be right. But I am glad of the opportunity, Virginios, to introduce you myself. Originally from Lithuania, Virginios graduated in 2012 from the Department of International Politics here at Aberystwyth with a degree in political studies. Um, the it, department is one of the departments in the faculty that I run uh, and it is a very exciting department to be able to engage with, as I have come to appreciate since being in my role. Virginius is one of 27 commissioners appointed by the European Council in 2019. The commissioners act as the political leadership team of the European Commission and are tasked with promoting the general interests of the EU by proposing and enforcing legislation and implementing policies and the EU budget. So quite a wide ranging and responsible uh, set of roles. Each commissioner is assigned responsibility for specific policy areas, with Virginius making strategy and policy decisions relating to the environment, oceans and fisheries policy areas that are, of course, highly pertinent for the theme of climate change. In terms of the format of today's panel, I'll just say a word about how things are going to work. So Virginius will speak for around 20 minutes about the European Union's hopes for the upcoming COP26 conference 
and its broader goals in relation to climate change. We will then have responses from three academic staff members at Aberystwyth University who are experts in various aspects of climate change. We have Dr Judith Thornton from IBUS, who is a low carbon manager for the Beacon project, which is seeking to promote decarbonisation in Wales through collaborations between academia and industry. We also have Dr Camilla Stolerova from Interpol, who is an expert on the ethics of security and in international political theory, as well as emergency politics, including climate emergency. And I think I'm right in saying that Camilla may have been a supervisor for Virginius's UG dissertation. So between them, they obviously did something right. Then we have, last but not least, from any perspective, Professor Helen Roberts, who's played a key role in our recent REF return, um, something which is vitally important to the institution. Helen is from DGIS and she's an expert on understanding past climate change. I've heard Helen talk about her work and it's certainly much more exciting than I make it sound there, but it, she is an expert in past, understanding past climate change, as well as predicting the environmental consequences of future climate change. So we will hear from each of those respondees in uh, once uh, Virginius has had an opportunity to take the floor and give us his insights, which we are, I think, which will be the highlight of today's events and, and possibly for many of us, the highlight of, of the week's events. Uh, so Virginius, I would like to hand the floor over to you, if that is a phrase you can use online, and welcome you to speak to us this morning. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and of course, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon to, to everyone and, and thank you for this invitation. It's of course uh, my great pleasure and, and, and privilege to talk to you today as my alma mater, Aberystwyth University and its community has a special place uh, in, in, in my heart. But of course, I'm, I'm, I'm here not to, 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 to share my memories today. Uh, but to talk about climate change and especially COP26, which is coming up very fast. Uh, and I think no one is satisfied with what's currently on the table. The world clearly needs more. We have to keep uh, making uh, that case and banging the drum for radical change. The science is clear. The world is warming rapidly due to human influence and the reports from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change show that each half uh, degree each year and each choice matters. And we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to net zero and scale up uh, action to protect and restore natural carbon sinks like forests, oceans and, and other ecosystems. And, and we need to, 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 to act uh, swiftly. We need decisive action to hold global warming and keep uh, the 1.5 degrees goal in reach while lessening the inevitable impacts of global heating. And the window of opportunity is closing fast and this decade will be decisive. Climate change is a symptom, a symptom of, of a wider problem our relentless uh, depletion of natural resources. That depletion brings other crises too, like biodiversity loss and, and pollution. And <clears throat> Europe has a systemic plan to tackle these crises and to set the world on a different path. That plan is the European Green Deal, our blueprint to make the EU climate neutral by 2050. It does that by supporting a just green transition that leaves no one behind, improving people's health and, and, and quality of life and protecting nature and the services it provides. This holistic vision is also part of the Union strategy to implement the United Nations uh, 2030 agenda and achieve the sustainable development. We un un unveiled the deal at COP25 in Madrid in December 2019. Since then, we have adopted a climate law to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. Now agreed with the Council and the Parliament, we have established a new emissions reduction target for 2030 of at least 55% compared with 1990. We have also presented a biodiversity strategy for 2030, a new circular economy action plan 
a hydrogen strategy, a methane strategy, an offshore strategy, and a new and ambitious strategy for climate adaptation. And of course, last but not least, uh, at the start of the summer, we adopted Fit for 55, a package of legal proposals to revise the main European climate and energy legislation, bringing them into line with the 55% goal. And this <clears throat> massive uh, revision will bring certainty for investors. And that's vital because investments are critical for the necessary transition. But the EU will not succeed unless the international community also joins the cause. Here, uh, the climate COP in Glasgow must deliver. It must set the world on an irreversible path towards the 1.5 degree uh, goal of Paris. And let's look uh, a bit more closely at EU ambitions for COP26. First of all, we want to keep 1.5 degrees within reach, and this means uh, we need all parties to deliver comprehensive long term net zero strategies and ambitious NDCs, nationally determined contributions. And uh, we want to encourage greater adaptation efforts by all parties to prepare for the impacts of climate change. As part of that, we want to see more nature based solutions. We need to mobilize climate finance to support action on the ground for both mitigation and adaptation. This also includes demonstrating how developed countries will achieve their collective goal of delivering 100 billion uh, dollars or, or almost 85 billion euros in, in public and mobilized private climate finance annually from 2020 to 2025 and providing reassurance that climate finance will continue to grow and that investments in nature will increase. And we need a successful conclusion on the negotiations on the implementation rulebook of the Paris Agreement. So that means in particular rules on transparency, accountability to track uh, progress towards the implementation of uh, NDCs. Many of the debates in Glasgow will focus on how far we are on track to deliver on existing ambitions for mitigation, adaptation and finance. And to be frank, uh, the data do not look good. The sixth IPCC assessment report published uh, on 9th of August uh, this year clearly shows that global average temperatures exceeding 1.5 degrees unless parties achieve urgently dramatic cuts in emissions. And I have outlined the efforts, uh, the EU efforts, in particular Fit for 55, which is now being discussed with Parliament and Member States. But Europe is a small part of the global picture. The EU accounts for around 8% of global emissions, and that share continues to fall. We need our partners to share our ambition. If all countries join a global race to zero emissions, then everyone wins the race. And we must motivate all countries to join a global race for climate neutrality. The EU and other progressive allies need to join forces to insist on ambition and to make sure all countries uphold their commitments under uh, the Paris Agreement. So what really needs to happen in Scotland? In practical terms, the nationally determined contributions and the long term strategies will be absolute key. And here the EU is showing the way we have upgraded our nationally uh, determined contribution with a new uh, near term 2030 target, at least 55% compared to 1990. All parties should arrive with uh, updated and uh, enhanced nationally determined contributions. They should respond to the urgency with long term strategies for the mid century that set us on a path to net zero emissions. And uh, parties should also uh, must come forward as soon as possible with adaptation communications. Their crucial part is, of course, finance. But of course, uh, there is much more done, uh, much more to be done uh, than these targets and goals. Citizens need to hear more from all parties and from business about other key issues, including how quickly we can expect the phasing out of coal and internal uh, combustion engine, and how fast we can phase in the technologies and emergency sources of the near future. That means a dramatic scaling up of renewables, for example, the production and use of green hydrogen, and the advent of a more resource efficient and circular economy. In parallel, we need a collective commitment to a robust and ambitious framework of rules as part of any outcome. Because if we fail to complete the rulebook, 
that could compromise the effective implementation of the Paris Agreement by all parties. And there is no one fact there is uh, that the truth is that we cannot escape and that is a, a certain amount of, of heating is now inevitable. That means that climate adaptation is absolutely essential. And earlier this year, uh, the EU adopted a new climate adaptation strategy. Uh, the EU remains fully committed to a sustained and increased investment in enhancing resilience. That also includes increased implementation of nature-based solutions, which deliver multiple benefits in the most disaster-prone countries and regions around the globe. One focus area of the new strategy is international cooperation on climate adaptation, prioritizing Africa, least developed countries, and small island developing states. Uh, the EU and its member states also support climate change action in, 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 in partner countries. And we are increasing our efforts uh, to help partner countries to, 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 enhance, uh, to enhance their adaptive capacities. Um, for first of all, assessing climate risks, for example, developing and implementing uh, national adaptation plans and advancing early warning systems and risk, uh, finding insurance tools and, and establishing monitoring and evaluation systems. And these activities will also help vulnerable communities to enhance their resilience. <clears throat> I began by reminding you that climate change is actually a symptom of something else, a symptom of a wrong approach based on the consumption of raw materials. There are other symptoms too, and biodiversity loss is one of the worst actually. Thus, we need to remember that COP26 is not the only international conference this year. The world needs an equal level of ambition at COP15. The biodiversity COP that opened in Kuming last week which continues with negotiations on substance next spring, and the biodiversity crisis is equally existential. And it's essential to tackle climate change and biodiversity loss in a systemic manner, because neither can be solved in isolation. COP15, in particular important, it is set to adopt a post-2020 global biodiversity framework as a stepping stone towards the 2050 vision of living in harmony with nature. This new global biodiversity framework should be coherent and consistent with the Paris Agreement. It too needs to include specific targets and, and, and headline indicators on climate change and nature-based solutions. So at COP15, the EU is advocating for an ambitious post-2020 global biodiversity framework. An outcome that fosters synergies with climate action in areas like nature-based solutions, financing ecosystem services and spatial planning, a coherent outcome that takes due account of the need to adopt, adapt biodiversity policies to climate change and to the consequences that we cannot escape. The financing gap is still enormous. We want to see commitments that significantly increase biodiversity funding to developing countries, setting a positive example. President von der Leyen recently announced a doubling of EU biodiversity finance, in particular to the most vulnerable countries. And we hope to see, of course, many others to follow suit. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the next few months will be crucial. It will be more important than ever to put aside differences and work together towards a common goal. We have very little time, but both of these COPs are crucial. And we need to remember that with optimism and political willingness, we can turn them into milestones for the green transformation. And if I say we have no time to wait, it's not a platitude. It's a simple scientific fact. So let's not uh, let's not waste that time. Let's use that time wisely and move forward. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for that inspiring uh, talk. Virginios. There are a couple of key questions that come to mind, but I'm going to turn to Judith and ask her to make a response to you as the first of our panel uh, respondees. So Judith, uh, please take the floor. To shoot a Tiachung Vaoyan e Virginios, I'm a point you really did the role at Akian when have it. Thank you everyone for, for coming this morning and, and thank you uh, to Virginius for his um, sort of insightful comments on the, the how the EU sees, sees COP26. Um, I think there's, there's sort of 
three uh, three things that I, I'd like to pick up pick up on really um, in relation to what uh, Virginius was saying. Um, the, the first the first one really is um, the the absolute imperative to keep uh, 1.5 degrees uh, within reach. Um, you know this is this has been a long-standing ambition that 1.5 degrees is is going to be serious but manageable. Uh, but that two degrees centigrade of warming is is going to be catastrophic um, for uh, for a significant number of nations. But unfortunately, we are currently on track to hit that 1.5 degree limit within the 2030s. OK, so uh, I'd like to echo uh, Virginius's point about how the next decade is absolutely crucial for action. OK, we cannot continue to put off our homework until 2045 because we're trying to be neutral by 2050. That simply is not how how much of this works. OK, so for example, within the UK, if we are phasing out uh, petrol and diesel vehicles in the 2030s, that doesn't allow the allow us to not be using any at all until about 2050. So decisions that we make in the next five to ten years really lock us into uh, to a future a future path uh, of climate change, uh, which is uh, which is pretty depressing in a sense. But we can also think about getting locked into more desirable uh, systemic change uh, within our economies. And I would like to think that uh, the UK is in a good position in terms of some of these things, because obviously we have the, the Climate Change Act. Um, so we have, uh, in addition to uh, commitments uh, in relation to uh, the COPs uh, and the National Determined Contributions, uh, we have legislation in the UK that commits us to uh, five yearly carbon budgets and gives us the the advice of the the committee on climate change on on how best uh, to reach those. But unfortunately, um, yeah. So we we do we do have the UK government being being held to account uh, internally uh, by the the committee on climate change. Um, but unfortunately, their their progress report is uh, is pretty damning, really. So we have uh, we've had five yearly uh, uh, carbon budgets. Um, and the the sixth carbon budget, which is which is in place and has been legislated for and accepted by the UK government. Um, in terms of the UK government's ambitions in relation to to uh, the sixth carbon budget, there is more than 50. The, the climate change committee say that more than 50 percent of uh, of likely emissions are either uh, strong act, strong likelihood of falling behind or uh, some risk of falling behind. And that's just on the level of ambition. If we look at the actual uh, the actual sort of equivalent numbers for uh, for the policies that would be required in, in terms of implementing those ambitions, there are less than 20 percent of what the UK government's actions uh, are are doing on the policy front that that put us on track to our legislated sixth carbon budget. So so even in a country where, you know, in theory we have these uh, these carbon budgets and in theory we're being held to account, we are clearly finding it very, very difficult um, to uh, to meet uh, to meet the, cha the challenges um, of climate change. I think the other point I'd like to to pick up on really is is what we would like to see from COP26. Um, I think my biggest fear for COP26, as I've already alluded to, is that we end up with this um, this putting our homework off, this this tendency to uh, to talk about technologies that haven't been invented yet as being part of the solution, because that's a very convenient uh, narrative for for governments who who are basically working in five year electoral cycles and and thinking about business as usual. Um, and the there's a, there's a really clear link between technologies that we need uh, and behaviours that we can all implement as as individuals. And and I tend to like to think of it, you know, how we combat climate change in terms of three main categories of things. There are there are the individual behaviours that we can all do ourselves. 
Uh, and then there are the sort of system level changes that governments and policymakers need to implement that make it easier for us to lead low carbon lifestyle. The third, uh, the third category of, of actions really is research. OK, so um, clearly there's there's lots of interesting research going on in Aberystwyth um, and uh, in other universities uh, on combating climate change. And I am always going to be a passionate defender of the need for research into these things. Uh, but we need to be clear that anything that hasn't been invented yet is not going to be saving us by 2035. OK, so the solutions that come out of COP26 will be based on research that has been done over the last 5, 10, 15 years, as opposed to the things that we are we are hoping to do uh, in the next uh, in the next few years here in Aberystwyth. I think I'd like to leave it there. Thank you. I think um, Helen is going to come in now in in response, probably both to beginners and to yourself. Judith, thank you for that. Very clear for me around the action categories, helpful in clarifying those levels of action that need to take place and where we sort of sit as individuals and then the wider community along that trajectory. So that was very useful. Um, Helen, please um, give your response. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I just wanted to, to really pick up for starters on, on Virginius's comments about um, every half a degree mattering, uh, matter, matters and also the, the necessity to really focus on speed in terms of response here because it's the speed of the change in climate and the vast spatial extent of the change um, in the environment that we've already seen, let alone what's predicted for the future, that is really so very shocking um, here. From my own area of research, looking at rates of climate and environmental change in the past, we can see that the rate of change today is typically much faster than the rates of natural change that we've seen in the past. And added to this, um, as Virginius has touched on, you know, humans are now actually also a massive earth moving force capable of making major changes to the environment, causing destabilisation of land surfaces, threatening habitats, causing loss of biodiversity and so on. But I think for me, I'm <laughs> trying to remain hopeful. If the pandemic's shown anything positive in the last 18 months, then for me, it's that people can come together to focus on tackling major threats, both through, um, uh, I'm hopeful here, ingenious and resourceful technological solutions. So I take Judith's point that if it hasn't been invented yet, it's not going to be helping us immediately. But I remain optimistic that there are, are more advances to be made, but also critically um, uh, benefits from uh, the small um, the sum of very uh, many small um, but collectively very powerful actions as, as individuals, as has already been alluded to. And I believe that we'll need to use a similar strategy to um, reduce the impact and mitigate for climate change um, in the future. I think um, being able to assess and monitor the direct and indirect impacts of anthropogenic activities and climate change on ecosystems and the environment is absolutely critical here. We need to know how well we are doing. Um, initiatives such as the Global Mangro Mangrove Watch that's um, led by the Earth Observation and Ecosystem Dynamics Group here at Aberystwyth um, could be a very powerful example of a, a tool that would help us do that. So this is enabling widespread access to near real-time data allowing monitoring and response of mangrove loss um, and but also monitoring conservation progress and um, looking at restoration of mangroves as well. It's been used by the UN Environment Programme for reporting against sustainable uh, development goals and also in the UN um, Ocean and Habitat Platform and others besides. And I think this is critical, as I say, to be able to to monitor our change. We need to be able to understand as well the response to climate change, um, which may be non-linear. So that's to say that there could be some kind of threshold or tipping points um, in some uh, responses to climate and environmental change. Um, so, for example, we've got colleagues in the Centre for Glaciology who are working to understand how ice sheets respond to climate change. They're looking at identifying and measuring cryospheric processes and evaluating their role in past, present and future global um, environmental change. Not only does this um, 
involve understanding things like looking at subglacial processes as the key to assessing how um, ice sheets will respond to climate change. But there may also be complex feedbacks and, and additional processes at work that we're, we're just starting to get to grips with. For example, um, we know that changes in colour of the ice surface due to the accumulation of dark particles, and mic microbial growth, um, changes in albedo, that's a reflectivity of the Earth's surface, and um, accelerates melting. So we need to be monitoring and also try to understand the physical response to the mechanics of climate change in the high and the mid and the low latitudes of the globe. But we also need to take action. Um, and that's obviously what we really hope to see from this COP26. And some of that action, I think, you know, will likely come from highly technological um, viewpoints, trying to look at things like um, CO2 sequestration, um, using microbes, biomineralization, um, that's being explored by the Low Carbon Energy and Environment Research Network Wales and also being explored through mathematical modelling of potential carbon capture and storage. But some of that action really will have to come from uh, changes in behaviour. And here again, it's going to be essential to take people and societies with us. Um, so encouraging sustainable behaviours is absolutely key. Um, and that have been touched on by by both speakers. Um, and that's been the focus of some of the work of the Aberystwyth um, Behavioural Insights Group here, looking at benefits of things like sustainable food systems and including um, things like greater resilience to environmental um, change through the use of traditional environmental knowledge and preservation of heritage foods and so on, movements like the slow food movement and more, all of those being explored here at Aberystwyth as part of a potential solution. And supported critically, I think, by better understanding exactly what our individual and collective impact is and the role of personal um, carbon allowances. An interesting emerging theme from colleagues in the Wizard Civil Society Research Centre based in Aberystwyth is research into new forms of social activism as well and the energy transition. So looking at campaigns for divestment from fossil fuels, for example, school strikes, community energy projects and the like. And um, I'm also pleased to acknowledge the role that the arts and humanities are also playing a really important role in trying to engage public audiences in a different route um, here through collaborative work. For example, at Aberystwyth, um, colleagues are using creative writing, poetry and art to offer new perspectives and approaches to understanding the nature of and problems posed by climate change. So. I'm optimistic, I have to be optimistic, I don't have an alternative, that we, but I'm optimistic that we have the tools to recognise and mitigate for and adapt to climate change, but the scale of this uh, challenge is enormous, as both speakers have touched on, and, and that's why we really need very strong leadership um, and to see action coming out of this COP26. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Um, there are some interesting questions coming in that touch on the themes that you're all raising, which we'll have a chance to put um, later on in the session. Um, Camilla, can I ask you to come in there um, at the end to sort of round us off, um, just giving your own perspective and response to some of the key things that you've heard? Thank you. Thank you very much, Anwan. Thank you very much, Virginius. Uh, I suppose coming from the Department of International Politics, I am expected to give you uh, uh, some uh, um, kind of yeah uh, stories about Virginius being an undergraduate student with us. Uh, I am not going to deliver on this uh, because I realise GDPR works so well. We have no trace whatsoever of, of Virginius' time in, his, in, in our department. I couldn't even find the year he graduated uh, uh, from us. Uh, so so all I can say, Virginia, is you look as great uh, uh, now as you did as a student, uh, and uh, and I, I really I really enjoyed uh, what you said. Uh, and thinking of your time, uh, of course, with us, kind of ten or so years ago, um, uh, it reminded me how a situation was so different back then in terms of us in international politics thinking about uh, about climate change and the possibility of change. I think we were much more pessimistic back then than we are now. And if you if you said that we need to be ambitious, 
I think now we all are much more responsive to this ambition because things have changed and also because the emergency that you spoke about is of course much more palpable. Uh, so I would say, I mean, oddly enough, I'm much more optimistic things can be done now than I was 10 years ago when you were uh, in the department. And I would like to re, um, kind of um, draw a kind of parallels from the pandemics. I mean, Helen already mentioned the pandemics. I think there is a lot to learn from the pandemics, both positive and negative, uh, because I mean, this was a kind of emergency that uh, fell on us, uh, right? And we responded uh, as a globe. And and I think yeah, there is lots of positive. I mean, how we responded as a globe. I think there is lots of positive to learn about kind of domestic uh, preparedness to deal with emergencies uh, from my perspective as as a as a as a somebody concerned with ethics uh, I was I was almost shocked how actually governments were ready to bypass all those established uh, processes even human rights to actually implement emergency measures with exceptional swiftness and, uh, and efficiency and how the public was responding positively so to me this is a really a lesson that if the public understands the the reasons behind an emergency, they are really ready to go a really long mile. So I think there is a source of optimism, but of course also a warning that uh, that uh, that maybe we don't want to sacrifice human rights uh, for too long, as as it did happen during the pandemics, of course. But there are also two areas which uh, kind of make me more worried, uh, unlike the kind of personal behavioral changes which I think will be will be coming. The first one is international cooperation. I mean, we experienced enormous international isolationism during the pandemics, and and certainly, I mean, I was surprised how China was treated and tip how everybody was tiptoeing around China uh, regarding COVID. And obviously, China is the big big elephant in the room when it comes to. Uh, when it comes to not only COP26 but all, all, uh, all climate uh, change uh, uh, measures. So, and then we have also, I mean, some kind of lukewarm participants, uh, whether it's Brazil, whether it's Russia. So, so international cooperation, but also international pressure, and and these are issues that uh, that I think are much more challenging uh, now than we thought they might be. And and I think the pandemics actually contributed negatively to this. And my my uh, second point of worry is really the strength of uh, international corporations. And again, that's something a process which we saw in the pandemics. I mean, smaller businesses uh, going down and bigger businesses getting more powerful and stronger and richer. And the public private uh, corporation that can be so uh, so uh, useful and so productive, very often actually ending in corruption because the emergency actually allowed this to happen. Certainly. I mean, something happening in the UK and not really many people talking about it, that enormous corruption that went hand in hand with emergency measures. So, so I'm thinking these are the uh, these are the issues that kind of accompany that optimism uh, uh, that I think you are right to to actually mention. And I'm, I'm glad that you are optimistic and I'm glad that you are ambitious. Uh, but at the same time, I think there are further challenges that we actually, I think, came to understand much better. Uh, uh, Thanks to the pandemic, so I think that's that's something that I wanted to kind of highlight from your talk and maybe add to a bit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a range of responses there, and really interesting in terms of the question of how we communicate and and the challenge that faces us not only in terms of legislation, in terms of policy, but in actually putting that into action and persuading people that they wish to to put their grist behind this particular mill. I think it's really interesting to hear our the four of you who are really quite different personalities and how you're all approaching it from your own distinct perspectives. And I think that that's a key thing for us because of course that's what our public is like. Um, well informed, um, but very different perspectives that all need to be brought together in some kind of, of um, powerful union. So uh, uh, there are questions coming in. Just before I start um, asking the questions, uh, Virginius, would you like to respond in any way to anything that um, any of the panelists said? Yes, uh, absolutely. Thank you very much uh, for your very informative and, 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 and very well put interventions. Um, 
So I will start with uh, with Judith, and 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 uh, probably I will a uh, bit uh, more uh, elaborate on uh, what I think was put very right about the technologies. I have the sense that um, it's easier to speak about the technologies uh, to politicians, to entrepreneurs, uh, people actually. Uh, because it's fancy, uh, because when you speak about the energy transition or especially the transport transition, uh, you you sort of offer something what's what's new, innovative. Uh, but um, absolutely, I think we miss the picture then, uh, because all that is needed and it's good and it will come. Uh, entrepreneurs and innovators they won't stop. They will do it without us and and especially with so much of of of. Uh, of public funding to be put on the table, I think this will drive the technological change even faster. But what's very uh, missing in the picture is um, a discussion about actually our ecosystems, about the environment and what they really do. And sometimes those uh, decisions are much cheaper and they just here um, at the reach. Um, some of you, you can see it through your window when, when, when watching over that beautiful sea. Uh, because if we just take a, a, a good care of, of our biodiversity ecosystems on land and on seas, that's already part of the solution. Uh, and, and, and pollution is one of the, the biggest the biggest causes of that, which uh, sometimes very much missed in, in, in discussions because they focus a lot on CO2 decrease, but rather than, 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 than pollution decrease. And that's why uh, my point was that we have to keep the two cops uh, very closely together uh, because I'm sometimes very uh, much shocked when I see that COP26 and COP15 might have a different uh, description of nature based solutions. So it's, it means two, two different approaches. It, it basically uh, really uh, puts us, uh, us back by uh, many steps. And overall, speaking about biodiversity, I think we are very much developed through the past years, especially with uh, Fridays for Future movement, with, with academia being very active, with, of course, innovation, green premiums coming at, at, at the affordable price. Um, so we have developed very well the, the discussion on climate change. And if you ask a person on the street, he will tell your opinion. Maybe he won't agree with it. Maybe he's going to have a different, but he has a couple of words to say about climate change. And that's great because that really pu uh, puts uh, additional heat on politicians. On biodiversity, I would say we're 10 years behind. If you ask anyone on, on biodiversity, I, I, I would guess every fifth person would say to, would have to say something. And uh, the worst that it's the, the part of the solution. You can solve one without solving the other. And uh, now also, you know, not jumping too much from from uh, the technologies, but also uh, answering a little bit to to what Judith Seth said and 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 maybe started and typed in the question about circular economy action plan. So I think that's that's the the sweetest part of 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 sort of uh, when we speak about climate change because it's very well accepted by everyone, by businesses, uh, uh, by by politicians, um, by people. Because what we basically aim to offer in, in our uh, circular economy action plan is first of all that we keep resources in economy as long as possible. And you can uh, you know, approach it from different angles. One of the angles can be uh, geopolitical security, um, um, meaning you know, having less dependency on third countries, on, on resources. And we're definitely going to need those resources, especially when it comes to, 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 to green solutions, batteries, one of the examples. And our uh, approach to batteries, uh, which is now a legislative proposal, is, I would say, a very much emblematic of how we uh, approach circular, circular economy in general. So our first aim is, of course, approaching the design stage. We're going to amend the eco design directive, uh, including seven uh, uh, product groups uh, that are, has the biggest um, potential for circularity. What's most important in the design stage is actually everything is decided. So in design stage is decided how long your phone is going to, 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 to work for you, when it's going to slow down. In design stage is decided if the screen is going to crack and it's possible to replace it or not. Uh, and so on. So it's very important for us that in design stage we put uh, everything so that 
the consumers, first of all, have a full picture uh, that they can uh, know not only the energy efficiency, but how long the goods is going to last. Are they replaceable? Are the spare parts possible to get and so on? Uh, of course, we aim at, at having uh, most of the goods that are going to be included in the directive that they could be repairable. Uh, the second, of course, production. So production making it uh, making it less polluting, mm, making it uh, sustainable. Uh, the third phase, which is very important, is use. So uh, how long is going to last? User experience, and then the the the, the very critical stage: what's next? So of course, in all those product groups, we want uh, steadily increase uh, their reuse or at least collection, out of which then new products could be could be could be could be produced and that closes sort of a, 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 a cycle that's going to be very hard because we have to take into account chemicals from which the the products are produced harmful chemicals have to be taken out and so on but i think we are on a good path the most importantly that it's really well accepted by the industry this is not something that they see as sort of additional bureaucratic burden of raising standards, but they really see it as a, as a competitive advantage. So I think we have a good path to 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 move uh, to move ahead, and um, our sustainable product policy, which is going to be the crucial, the center of of all the change, is going to be out in in, in January, and I hope uh, you will have a chance in Abris to also discuss it. Um, right, moving to 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 Helen. Uh, I really like the, the link of, of taking something good out of this pandemic. And one thing which I which I really agree that that uh, this pandemic really made us turn a little bit uh, closer to nature, to value what nature can uh, bring us. Uh, people try to escape cities, uh, move to to outskirts, uh, really reconnect with nature, and that given an opportunity to especially large cities. Uh, which has huge pollution problems to really reconsider their policies. And now, uh, as most of them, they have infringement procedures started against them due to um, air pollution. I really see significant changes. Uh, politicians who would never speak about it really implementing a changes of actually closing Main Street, making them available to, 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 to pedestrians trying to, to have more green uh, green infrastructure, green buildings and so on. So that really comes and, and that urban change happening. And I think the pandemic was a little bit of a push for that because uh, many realized that we can actually enjoy a fresh, clean air in our cities. We just need uh, extra hustle and political willingness uh, for for that and of course again that's a uh, dramatic decrease uh, a chance for a dramatic decrease for a pollution last but not least um, uh, camilla uh, i really like your intervention about the the, the uh, optimism and 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 and, and that uh, opportunity window is there and i truly believe that it is of course it will require enormous effort especially when we speak about the the the, the third countries who really needs our uh, assistance uh, financial because we all had our emissions uh, uh, emissions uh, out when we were building our infrastructure. We have our infrastructure, we enjoy it, and they still need it. So of course, uh, we need to find the solutions how to, to help them. And, and for some, we don't even have any solutions like cement, steel, uh, and, 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 and so on. So that's a massive challenge. But if we leave them uh, with that challenge, they definitely not going to 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 solve it on its own. They just going to choose the same path as we did, and I think we have no right to 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 blame them for that because, as I said, you know, uh, they want to be where are we are now. So that 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 will take a massive contributions. But I also see that the political window of opportunity is there because we see increased China ambition. So now they have the 2060 uh, goal, same as Brazil. Yes, it's not enough. But it's already they are at the discussion uh, table. Uh, them stopping uh, funding of all uh, coal, uh, uh, coal power plants outside China and domestically, it's already a big step. So it will, of course, depend not only on mm, nations as a players, but also uh, banks, institutions and so on, where the money is going to be channeled. And, 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 and I think, uh, you know, here we can see a, a positive, positive trends. Uh, 
we have a different rhetorics from the US and that's also inspiring. Uh, US announced about their 2030 goal, which is 53% uh, decrease, which is very close to our 55%. Of course, again, it will require massive work and, and action, but uniting powers uh, with, with, the, with the countries that are now united in, in, in COP26, such as Australia, New Zealand, UK, EU, US, that that's already gives a, a, a Japan massive, uh, massive uh, diplomatic leverage and of course funding. So it will be very tough and hard negotiations, but the political opportunity window is there. COVID, of course, a little bit, uh, um, how to say, cool down the 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 the, the approach that we, we would have uh, before it, uh, because I think that was a very good sequence for, for everything. Uh, but still, uh, I see now increased activity with uh, flights uh, return. People can finally meet, uh, even so contribute some CO2, but those live meetings really help uh, in establishing a dialogue, in really understanding each other's issues. And, and uh, I truly hope uh, that the outcome is going to be a win-win for everyone, win-win for a planet and win-win for, of course, a people. Thank you so much. I, I there was a question has come in on circular economy action plan, but I think, Virginius, you sort of covered that off in your response to Judith. And, and it is something just as a, as a normal consumer that, that in my lifetime has been quite a shock actually to go from a, a situation and a society where we fix things to a situation in a society where the word fix just seems to be almost derisable at this point. I mean, you know, just go out and buy another one um, and what you do with the old one is up to you. So I think um, it's quite inspiring to hear of that quite simple plan there outlined it. I'm sure there are more com there's more complexity to it, of course, but I think, you know, it is quite inspiring. And also, I think an as another aspect of that is returning to that um, period when we actually had really specialised skills in uh, repairing and understanding how things worked. And we have lost that and that is something that relates to knowledge. So so the impacts of um, you know, the climate emergency go go far beyond even the things we've we've discussed today. And there are losses that we haven't yet recognised, I think. Um, there is an interesting question that's come in around. Um, I think, Virginia, you were emphasising the biodiversity angle and, and the importance of having both those narratives in sync. And we do have have a question around um, around that that's come in from Catherine Duggan. So she's asking, how can we most effectively connect up actions to support both COP15 and 26 targets? What are likely to be the joint priority areas? So thank you very much for a question. I would say, first of all, you know, we have to have uh, the the outcome of, 20, uh, of COP26, which leads to, to, to sort of I don't want to call it a additional pressure, but at least a uh, positive spin uh, of, 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 of COP15. And that's first of all, of course, uh, clearance of, of, of wording, having, uh, you know, uh, same position on, on, on simple things like nature based solutions. Then, of course, when it comes to funding, uh, clearly stepping up funding is going to be an uh, important task at both COPs. So, of course, part of that funding has to go for uh, for biodiversity as a solution. And thirdly, I think, you know, overall uh, in the leaders language, uh, when when they are discussing CO2 emissions and so on, they have to uh, really realize what the natural things do, uh, their importance and having this language uh, um, well uh, acquainted in the in the COP26 uh, decision would definitely serve well for COP15, which then can continue and sort of uh, uh, signal on the continuation of co COP26 ambition and really like sort of uh, announcing that we are in COP15, we're sort of putting a picture together and that they are connected. 
and that these both issues are interlinked and we cannot solve uh, one without the other. And of course, maintaining the same ambition. Then of course, it will be a lot of language on at the both COPs on, on percentage of achieving something and, and, and so on. I think both COPs has to be very clear of not only uh, the targets uh, that they're going to have, but really of uh, interim goals, of uh, monitoring, uh, everything what can be measured must be measured and must be put in very clearly uh, so that we would really could have a chance to return and see where we are in progress. Uh, so not only those fancy goals, which are usually works as a very good marketing tool, uh, should be a priority. Uh, they are important, of course, uh, but also what is under them. So both COPs has to, to have that in place. Thanks, that, that's a really helpful um, response. Now, there is a question from Jan Brutzka, whom I, I think you know. So Jan starts with a very warm greetings to you, um, Virginius, but then uh, poses a very difficult question. So I can only apologise for that, but I'm sure you're used to his challenges. So he is actually asking, um, could you please um, say a little bit about whether attention in the UK EU relationships has affected cooperation on climate change. Uh, first of all, thank you very much and my uh, sincere greetings to, 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 to Jan and, and for no, the question is actually a very good question and, and I think it's it's worth uh, touching upon uh, because actually what climate agenda, uh, environmental agenda really gives us, I think it gives us a platform uh, where we can work with everyone around the globe and not really affecting those uh, very much you know issues which are concerned with trade with 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 other geopolitical issues and so on i would say on climate agenda eu is 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 trying to cooperate with 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 russia with china uh you know and 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 and, and so on we just recently put uh, forward our arctic policy so with uk i would say it's rather excellent on 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 climate ambition and and uh, and alok sharma uh who is responsible for cop 26 i've met him multiple times uh, vice president timmermans uh, did and our positions are very much uh, in line mm, and i hope that it will turn at some point into some green race which will uh, only make uh, everyone everyone uh, a champions. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm very happy to, happy to see the UK ambition of uh, fully decarbonizing by 2045. So I remember like two years ago, we sort of opened that club of, of zero uh, um, uh, of zero emissions by 2050. And uh, we of course were under a lot of pressure uh, from uh, businesses within the EU that what we are doing is too bold, too ambitious, and nobody will support and others uh, is going to only use that. And of course, our businesses are going to put out of the uh, competitive advantage. And it was very hard to, 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 to argue that saying that, of course, we'll put a lot of uh, a lot of efforts to, to, to really get uh, more countries uh, on board. And I would say that, you know, the club is not only now expanded, uh, having many countries on board, but we have even more ambitious ones like UK or even 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 our member states like Finland, Sweden, who also have you know more ambitious plans than than the EU. So I I, I would say that uh, cooperation is 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 excellent, and I hope that uh, that unification of powers will 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 only lead to to a positive uh, positive outcomes. Thank you. Um, there's a question around COVID. I know Helen um, sort of outlined or, or at least included reflections on COVID in, in her contribution. Um, but I think it also probably goes back to something that Judith touched on as well around um, what we have learned and, and when we've learned it and, and, and how useful it is in terms of its timing, if you see what I mean. So perhaps our ambitions for the future in terms of technology aren't as useful as they might be now. Um, so the question is around um, whether panel members or, or yourself again, your, um, could tell us anything around any research that has come out as a result of COVID or during the COVID period in, in terms of whether there were any positive impacts on the climate uh, that resulted from the from the COVID crisis, things like people not traveling, 
um, you know, people not using their cars, um, so, all this sort of thing. So I, I can briefly answer and then maybe give to 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 to, to panelists as, as well. Uh, but I will say just we 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 of course uh, noticed a drop of of, of air pollution in in the cities, uh, but. I wouldn't say that it's something that we should stick with and say that this is it, we did it. First of all, it's the wrong way. Uh, secondly, it's temporary. So uh, there is uh, way uh, a, a lot of work ahead of us. And, and those uh, temporary drops in certain numbers, in certain particles, they really don't do, do a change because uh, as soon as, you know, uh, things are getting back to, to, to normal as they can. Of course, we won't wake up one day and the virus is just going to be gone. It's going to be with us, but the things uh, we, we are uh, adjusting to it and, 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 uh, and the numbers, they will bounce back. So I wouldn't be too optimistic about, about any of those, those numbers. I would rather stick on, on really the work that has to be done in order to uh, put them down uh, for, 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 for a while. Thank you. I think Helen, would you like to come in there with a comment? Yeah, no, I just agree with with all of that. I mean, I think, you know, obviously that was just a, a temporary change, although I think one of the things again that I would take from this, I think, is the um, the speed of change, which which I just think was unprecedented. That's the way we so rapidly had to change that the way we did things. Um, I think even this meeting that we're having now, um, I'm not sure that that would have occurred to us to do it like this two years ago. And now this is second nature. So I'm optimistic there are, that there are positives that we can learn, but but uh, unfortunately, um, no easy fixes just, just for climate. So as, as Virginius has just said, we need to pile the pressure on and keep those goals firmly in sight. Thank you, Helen. Um, we are sort of drawn towards the close, but there is a final question. I would like to ask Rhys um, to put that question um, because I think it's key to some of the work that Rhys does. And um, obviously Rhys has been quite key in organising today's event. So I'm, I would like to give him the opportunity to ask his question directly. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, am I live? Oh yeah, great. Uh, yeah, Perfectly live to me. Yeah, thanks to everyone who's contributed. Um, I think, Virginius, you said at the beginning of your talk that the science is clear on climate change, and we've heard from different disciplinary perspectives here. Um, but I just wondered, is there a sense now in which uh, the main debates around climate change need, need to focus rather on the science of climate change, on the social science of climate change? on arts and humanities approaches to climate change and thinking about things to do with communicating climate change effectively, changing behaviours in relation to climate change, international politics and climate change. So I, I wondered, you know, what, what the panellists thought about that uh, interdisciplinary debate almost. Yes, please, uh, beginning just come in. I, I, I was a bit lost is it to me or to panelists question, but uh, but no, no. Uh, so abs absolutely, you know, you can't take a climate change agenda as sort of a narrow environmental agenda. I know it sounds like when we are discussing it, but then if you if you really take a, 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 a cut, uh, it's 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 horizontal because first of all, it's going to affect. Different uh, different uh, 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 different subjects. Uh, we already talked today about the science innovation. We talked about diplomacy. We talked uh, about uh, um, um, industry. We talked about uh, uh, um, uh, energy transition and, and etc. So it's it's really you cannot find an area which that is not going to to affect. Uh, we we haven't touched about agriculture, but it will need a massive change. And, and 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 so on. Uh, when we speak about the uh, social behavior, absolutely. And therefore, that's why uh, when we put our climate law up front, uh, we didn't have a number yet, because the 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 the, the previous ambition was uh, forty percent by twenty thirty. And of course, the huge pressure was on the Commission. So where is the number? Uh, how can you put the climate law without the number? And we needed four months 
he has almost four months to do a socio-economic impact assessment of what is realistic to achieve, how it's going to affect uh, industry, uh, uh, social life of, of, of people, which industries is going to have to, 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 to pay a biggest toll, which uh, member state is going to be most affected, and, and, and so on. Only after that impact assessment was uh, carried out, we came to a at least 55 uh, uh, degrees goal, uh, which would be realistic, implementable, uh, and 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 of course uh, in line with with that impact assessment. So uh, absolutely, I think climate change uh, as a as an agenda, it really touches upon upon many issues, uh, even even financial sectors, banking, and 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 so on. It just now everywhere, and and you can't, I think move things without really taking uh, it into 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 account. Thank you. I know that um, both Judith and then Camilla would like to just come in on on this with their final comments. Yeah, so um, I mean, I think that the, that sort of link between technology and behaviour is is really interesting and important, and it, it's also something that politicians are conventionally quite reluctant to deal with this idea of telling people uh, what they should be willing to do. Um, but certainly one of the things that's worked quite well in the UK is this whole idea of citizens assemblies and actually talking to people about what type of changes uh, they they might be they might be willing to make in relation to diet, in relation to aviation, uh, in relation to use of public transport, that kind of thing. Um, and I suppose the end point of that really is that the the UK's Committee on Climate Change reckons that 59% um, of the emissions reductions that we will uh, need in the sixth carbon budget uh, are going to be a combination of technology and behaviour. So they think about 40% in total is just pure technological shift, but the rest is interactions between technology and behaviour. Yeah, yeah, just briefly because I'm aware of time. Uh, I mean, obviously, I, I, I can uh, but agree that this is a social science and humanities issue and the challenges are enormous because it's not only about the kind of knowledge, scientific knowledge it being implemented on the population, right? The, the problem is, I mean, how you how you actually do that uh, knowledge transfer so that you don't dismantle all the kind of citizenship uh, building that has been done for for centuries certainly in the west but do happening also in the developing world and i think that's the challenge that the social sciences will be emphasizing more and more now uh, is 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 really how to actually bring people in rather than a top down approach because that will be easy a top down approach but i think with that we would basically kill our civilization uh, and and i mean that's not really the uh, the the, the, the uh, price to pay for for preventing climate change so i think the challenges at the moment i think the biggest challenges are really the challenges of social science nature. Thank you. Um, we've come to a close. I know I, we're really, really grateful to all of you for your time today, particularly to you, Virginia your son. I know you need to leave as promptly as you can at one o'clock. So I'm just going to say thank you so much for the contribution. I, I know that we are all particularly proud of our connections with you um, and are just thrilled to have such an inspiring speech from you today, I think giving us clear insight into a sense of political will and motivation and sort of the framework of legislation that is there to shore that up. Um, thank you very much to our panellists today uh, uh, for their optimism and for their insight. I think we've had a real mix of optimism and realism and, and we're just left with a very clear sense of the power of our own contributions and the power of our own responsibility in this respect. So just thank you to you all. Um, this has been a great event with which to launch the festival. Um, I want to refer you to the festival website, to the fascinating range of events that continue throughout the week. But clearly from my perspective today, today has been the best to date. And thank you all so much for your contributions. I hope we will be, we will be able to continue this discussion uh, at a later stage. So Diolch yn fawr iawn i bawb am i ymroddiad, ei ymrwymiad heddi. Thank you to you all. Thank you.